Greetings and welcome back to ABN's Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer, and we have been discussing over the last few episodes the Bible in the Quran, the Quran's use of biblical figures, the way in which biblical material is recast in the Quran. And of course, the Quran has a very singular preoccupation with the original developers, the original uh, creators of the Bible themselves, the Jews. Anyone who wonders why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict seems immune to any solution and why the Palestinians perpetually disregard every agreement as soon as they sign it should look into what the Holy Book of Islam says about the Jews. Reading the Quran, a believing Muslim will learn that the Jews are crafty, scheming deceivers, inveterate rebels against the authority of Allah, and above all, the fiercest enemies of the Muslims. It is hard to see how a Muslim accepting the Quran as divine revelation can possibly view the Jews as negotiating partners worthy of even the most basic human respect. But how did it come to this? Now, as we've seen in previous episodes, the Quran presents Muhammad as the last and greatest in the line of the biblical prophets, preaching a message identical to theirs. The authentic Torah supposedly commands Jews to follow Muhammad and recognize his prophecy. Those who refuse to accept Muhammad as a prophet are, in the Muslim view, rejecting both Moses and the real prophecies of the Torah. It is no surprise then that in the Quran, both David and Jesus curse the disbelieving Jews for their disobedience. You can find that at chapter 5, verse 78. Yet, of course, Torah observant Jews did not and do not accept Muhammad as a prophet. And this, according to Islamic tradition, enraged the prophet of Islam during his life. Muhammad initially appealed energetically to the Jews, hoping they would accept his prophetic status. He even had the Muslims imitate the Jews by facing Jerusalem for prayers. And he adopted for the Muslims the Jews' prohibition of pork. But he was infuriated when the Jews rejected him, and Allah shared his fury in Quranic revelation. They had the Torah, and the Quran confirmed it, and yet they refused to accept the Quran. And when there came to them a messenger from Allah, confirming what was with them, a party of the people of the book threw away the book of Allah behind their backs, as if they did not know. Another Jewish leader has noted, in according to the Quran, that no covenant was ever made with us about Muhammad. Allah again responds through his prophet, is it ever so? that when they make a covenant, a party of them set it aside. The truth is, most of them believe not. Once his breach with the Jews solidified, Muhammad received a revelation instructing the Muslims to face Mecca instead of Jerusalem for prayers and declaring that the prayers in the direction of Jerusalem were only a test for the believers. The revelation even asserted that the Jews and the Christians knew that the Muslims' new direction for prayer was the correct one. Chapter 2, verses 143 and 144 of the Quran say, The people of the book know well that it is the truth from their Lord, nor is Allah unmindful of what they do. That is referring to the new direction for prayer to Mecca. So this coincides with what we discussed last week about how it is basic Islamic belief that the Jews and the Christians know the truth of Islam and refuse to accept it, that they are aware that Islam is the real religion from Allah, but they absolutely will not uh, acknowledge that publicly out of a desire for base material gain. Several traditions report that some rabbis at the time when the Qibla, the direction for prayer, was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca, approached Muhammad and told him that they would declare him a prophet themselves and accept Islam if he would just turn his people's prayers back to Jerusalem. So here again we see that uh, the, the Jews and the Christians also are inveterately, in, in, invariably portrayed in the Quran as being uh, people who are selfish, people who are greedy, people who are untrustworthy, people who uh, are out for their own self-aggrandizement and nothing more. Muhammad refuses their request and he received another revelation the fools among the people say, will say, what has turned them from the Qibla to which they were used? Say, to Allah belong both east and west. He guides whom he wills to a way that is straight. 
two, chapter 2, verse 142. Here again we see he guides whom he wills, and there are others whom he created but chooses not to guide. In addition to the curses that fall on them specifically, the Jews share with Christians the opprobrium that the Quran heaps upon the so-called people of the book. Now this comes in marked contrast to the tolerant attitude that is attributed to the Quran by many Islamophilic scholars. Islam, says Harun Yahya, that is Adnan Akhtar, a Turkish apologist for Islam, he says, Islam is a religion of peace, love, and tolerance. Today, however, some circles have been presenting a false image of Islam, as if there were conflict between Islam and the adherents of the two other monotheistic religions. Yet Islam's view of Jews and Christians who are named the people of the book in the Quran is very friendly and tolerant. Similarly, journalist Yvonne Ridley, who is herself a convert to Islam, wrote this in 2006. We respect the people of the book. The Quran tells us that it is our duty to protect Jews and Christians and allow them to practice their faith in peace. Now, Ridley didn't say anything about the Quran's directive to make the Jews and Christians feel themselves subdued, according to chapter 9, verse 29, that is, submit under Islamic law, under the rule of Islamic law, and pay the jizya, the special tax that is de designed to be paid by the Jews and the Christians, but not by the Muslims. Now, the thing about this is, is that that is the condition for this protection. The dimma is the contract of protection for the non-Muslims, but it is a protection that comes at the price of degradation, of inequality. Uh, the notorious one-eyed, hook-handed British imam and jihad leader who's recently been extradited to the U.S., Abu Hamza al-Masri, maintained in the early 2000s a website called Supporters of Sharia. And in its Q&A that was once posted this question, I have been hearing some people say that the Jews and Christians are people of the book. And since they are people of the book, we ought not to call them kufar, mushrikun, which is a word for those who commit shirk, the worst sin in Islam, the association of partners in worship with Allah, or any other derogatory terms, because Allah called them the people of the book. May we call the Jews and Christians kufar or mushrikun? And uh, the answer that came from Abu Hamza or one of his assistants was not particularly ecumenical minded or mindful of the great Abrahamic religions that we all are supposed to be together in uh, uh, brothers in worship. Only the most ignorant and animal minded individuals would insist that prophet killers, Jews, and Jesus worshipers, Christians, deserve the same rights as us. If you want to know the rights of Jews and Christians, read Surat at Talba. Ayat 29, that is chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran, which mandates that Jews and Christians must indeed pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. And in fact, traditional Islamic law based on that verse has never granted to the people of the book the same rights as those enjoyed by Muslims. Being designated people of the book only accords Jews and Christians and a few others the ambiguous privilege of being allowed to practice their religion under the protection of Islamic law, which mandates these severe restrictions, making sure that they feel themselves subdued. Now, there is some value to this, for though the protected peoples, the Dimmis, the Zummis, do not enjoy equal rights with Muslims, at least they are allowed to maintain their religious identity. In a tradition, a hadith, Muhammad directed his followers to invite non-Muslims to convert to Islam, and if they refuse, to call upon them to pay the jizya, and if they refuse both, to go to war with them. By contrast, those non-Muslims who do not qualify as people of the book, such as Hindus under a strict reading of Islamic law, although there was a time in which the, during the conquest of India, there were so many Hindus uh, that it was impossible not to accord them people of the book status and they were given honorary people of the book status because otherwise as pagans they would have been given only the choice of convert or die. Convert or die would mean that all those Hindus would have had to have been killed. Many hundreds of millions were killed but ultimately they were given this honorary people of the book status. Thus people of the book are allowed to enter into a state of subjugation vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims that is not accorded to others. A dubious honor to be sure, and one meant to enforce upon them a constant sense of the degradation that is due them because of their rejection of Muhammad and Islam. The ninth century Quranic scholar, At-Tabari, emphasizes that the tax that the people of the book must pay was meant to be 
humiliating and degrading. Abasement and poverty were imposed and laid down upon them. The dimmies posture during the collection of the jizya. They lower themselves by walking on their hands. This degradation falls especially on the Jews. Now why is that? Because the Jews used to kill the messengers of God without God's leave, denying their messages and rejecting their prophethood. Now this meme, the Jews as prophet killers, has become one of the dominant tropes of Islamic anti-Semitism. For all the Quran's repeated charges that the Jews killed their prophets, which comes up many times in the Quran, three times in chapter two, three to four times in chapter three, and once in chapter four, and once in chapter five, only one such victim is named. When the Quran depicts the Jews boasting, quote, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, which is in chapter four, verse 157. Yet, as we shall see, the same verse later states that the Jews did not actually kill Jesus, but only thought they did. It appeared so unto them. So the Quran strangely declines to provide a single example to back up one of its most incendiary and often repeated accusations against the Jews. In any case, it's hardly appropriate for Muslims to act peaceably toward the Jews when the Jews, according to the Quran, are prone to war especially against Muslims. Whenever the Jews kindle the fire of war, says the Quran, Allah extinguishes it. That's chapter 5, verse 64. The Tafsir al-Jalalain specified that this verse refers to war against the Prophet. And according to Bulan Shahri, who is another commentator on the Quran, the Jews make every effort to instigate wars against the Muslims, but Allah foils their attempts each time, either by instilling terror in their hearts or by their defeat in these battles. Now that's extraordinary when you think about it, that the idea is that the Jews are always making war. Now we see with the Oslo Accords, with the roadmap, with the withdrawal from Gaza, with the uh, offer, the, the, the original partition offer in uh, 1948 from the UN, the Jews uh, in Israel have always been trying to make peace. Uh, tr even uh, open to the, op uh, the possibility of a Palestinian state if it would accept peace with Israel. But the main groups there, Hamas and the uh, Palestinian authorities, Fatah, will never accept the idea that they need to jettison the uh, statements in their charters, their founding documents, that Israel must be utterly destroyed. Now this is because it is absolutely impossible for them to lay down their arms and essentially make peace with the Jews when according to the Quran, the Jews are always trying to make war against them. And of course, we see this projection also in Palestinian propaganda that constantly tries to provoke attacks in civilian areas by mounting attacks against Israel from civilian areas so that the retaliatory fire can be used for propaganda purposes and to illustrate the claim that the Jews are always trying to make war against the Muslims. The Jews, in other words, are always striving to do mischief on the earth. That is, fasad, for which the punishment is specified in chapter 5, verse 33 of the Quran. They will be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet on alternate sides cut off or will be expelled out of the land. Expelled out of the land. No negotiated settlement is possible. The rebellion against Allah that has resulted in the Jews' degradation, the terrible agony that those who have rejected Islam are to feel in this world as well as in the next, according to the Quran's chapter 3, verse 56, is a frequent preoccupation of the book in general. Departing from his earlier tendency to appeal to the Jews as the authorities on what Allah has revealed, Muhammad began to criticize them for concealing parts of the revelation. The Quran several times criticizes Jews for refusing to follow Muhammad and asking, why don't the Jews' rabbis stop their evil behavior? It's chapter 5, verse 63. In a particularly egregious transgression, the Jews even dare to say that Allah's hand is fettered or chained. According to chapter 5, verse 64, it's unclear what Jewish concept, if any, the Quran is referring to here, but the classic Islamic commentators on the Quran show no uncertainty as to what the verse is about. Ibn Kathir comments, Allah states that the Jews, may Allah's continuous curses descend on them until the day of resurrection, describe him as a miser. Allah is far holier. 
than what they attribute to him. According to Islam, Allah is free with hand absolutely unchained and bound by no laws. He is not bound even to govern the universe according to consistent and observable laws. As the Quran states, he cannot be questioned about what he does. This theological tenet not only helped to cultivate anti-Semitism within mainstream Islam, but it also hindered the spread of science in Muslim societies. It seemed to Muslims as if there was no point to observing the workings of the physical world. There was no reason to expect any consistent pattern. If Allah could not be counted on to be consistent, why waste time observing the order of things? It could change tomorrow. The idea that Allah had constructed the universe according to observable laws would have been for pious Muslims tantamount to saying, Allah's hand is fettered. The Hamas Charter asserts that the Islamic resistance movement, and that is the name of the organization, Hamas is an acronym for that, believes that the land of Palestine is an Islamic waqf, consecrated for future Muslim generations until Judgment Day. A waqf is a religious endowment, a bestowal from Allah. Consequently, the charter goes on, it or any part of it should not be squandered. It or any part of it should not be given up. Neither a single Arab country nor all Arab countries, neither any king or president, nor all kings and presidents, neither any organization nor all of them, be they Palestinian or Arab, possess the right to do that. Now this is, not a main, this is not an eccentric view, this is a mainstream view among Muslims today. However, there is another strange development. Recently, several Muslim spokesmen have claimed that the Quran promises the land of Israel to the Jews and that the Muslim claim to Israeli land is therefore illegitimate on Islamic grounds. And so they're going against the mainstream in Islamic tradition about the Quran's treatment of the Jews. But of course, this is a comforting and pop popular message that some of the spokesmen have taken to Jewish audiences, reinforcing in them the idea that the Islamic Jihad imperative against Israel is simply the province of a tiny minority of extremists among Muslims, and that the voices of reason and moderation and Quranic authenticity will eventually prevail in the Islamic world. Alas, it is unfortunate to say this, but these spokesmen are spreading a false message based on a partial and highly misleading reading of the Quran. Those who make this argument usually base it primarily upon chapter 5, verse 21 of the Quran, in which Moses declares, O oh, my people, enter the holy land which Allah has assigned to you, and turn not back ignominiously, for then you will be overthrown to your own ruin. The London-based Imam Muhammad al-Husseini emphasizes that this statement is a narrative from God concerning the saying of Moses to his community from among the children of Israel and his order to them according to the order of God in, to him, ordering them to enter this holy land. And indeed, At-Tabari is not unique in this. Ibn Kathir says in his interpretation of chapter 5, verse 21, that the Jews were the best among the people of their time, a designation that recalls the Quran's designation of the Muslims as the best of people in chapter 3, verse 110. And the parallels Ibn Kathir imagines that he sees between the Muslims and the Jews don't end there. He even has the Jews waging jihad. He says this, Allah states next that Moses encouraged the children of Israel to perform jihad and enter Jerusalem, which was under their control during the time of their father Jacob. Jacob and his children later moved with his children in a household to Egypt during the time of the prophet Joseph. His offspring remained in Egypt until their exodus with Moses. They found a mighty, strong people in Jerusalem who had previously taken it over. Moses, Allah's messenger, ordered the children of Israel to enter Jerusalem and fight their enemy and he promised them victory and triumph over the mighty people if they did so. Of course, this is not the end of the story. Predictably, the Jews disobeyed Allah. Consequently, Ibn Kathir says, they were punished for 40 years by being lost, wandering in the land, uncertain of where they should go. This was their punishment for defying Allah's command. In contrast, stand the Muslims. The Muslim Ummah, he says, is more respected and honored before Allah and has a more perfect legislative code and system of life. It has the most honorable prophet, the larger kingdom, more provisions, wealth, and children, a larger domain, and more lasting glory than the children of Israel. And the idea that the glory of the children of Israel was not lasting undermines the entire argument that Allah promised the land of Israel to the Jews. 
One might wonder why, if Allah gave Israel to the Jews, the Islamic world from Morocco to Indonesia manifests such hostility to Israel. Why have so few Muslims ever actually noticed that Allah wants the Jews to possess the land of Israel if he does? One reason may be that they read such Quranic passages as chapter 2, verse 61, which says that some Jews who rebelled against Moses were covered with humiliation and misery. They drew on themselves the wrath of Allah. This because they went on rejecting the signs of Allah and slaying his messengers without just cause. This because they rebelled and went on transgressing. Meanwhile, those Jews who did not rebel or transgress converted to Islam. The idea that good Jews are those who convert to Islam is deeply rooted in Islamic tradition. In the 1970s, Muhammad Sayyid Tantawi, an Islamic scholar who served as for a considerable period of time as the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar University in Cairo, the most respected institution in Sunni Islam, wrote a 700-page treatise called Jews in the Quran and the Tradition, in which he concluded this. The Quran describes the Jews with their own particular degenerate characteristics, i.e., killing the prophets of Allah, corrupting his words by putting them in the wrong places, consuming the people's wealth frivolously, refusal to distance themselves from the evil they do, and other ugly characteristics caused by their deep-rooted lasciviousness. Only a minority of the Jews keep their word. All Jews are not the same. The good ones become Muslims. The bad ones do not. Finally, some cite another series of Quranic verses as proof that Allah promised Israel to the Jews, including, oddly enough, verses in which Muslims, that is, the best of peoples, are contrasted with the perverted transgressors among the people of the book. You are the best of peoples, evolved for mankind, enjoining what is right, forbidding what is wrong, believing in Allah. If only the people of the book had faith, it were best for them. Among those are some who have faith, but most of them are perverted transgressors. They will do you no harm, barring a trifling annoyance. If they come out to fight you, they will show you their backs, and no help shall they get. Shame is pitched over them like a tent, wherever they are found, except when under a covenant of protection from Allah and from man. They drew on themselves wrath from Allah, and pitched over them is the tent of destitution. This because they rejected the signs of Allah and slew the prophets in defiance of right. This because they tra rebelled and transgressed beyond bounds. That's chapter 3, verse 110 through 112. Within this thunderous denunciation of Jews and Christians, some highlight the brief reference to some people of the book being under a covenant from Allah. This most likely refers to the covenant of the Dimma, under which Jews and Christians live as subject peoples ruled by Islamic law. Some interpreters, however, argue that this refers to a covenant Allah made with the Jews to give them the land of Israel. But even if this were the case, the Quran also says that the Jews broke whatever covenant with Allah they had made. Chapter 5, verse 13 of the Quran says, And because of their breaking the covenant, their covenant, we have cursed them and made hard their hearts. They change words from their context and forget a part whereof they were admonished. You will not cease to discover treachery from all, save a few of them. But bear with them and pardon them. Lo, Allah loves the kindly. Being thus accursed, according to the Quran, the Jews are not the legitimate inheritors of the promise made in chapter 5, verse 21, where it says you will be inheritors of the land of Allah. The ones who are the inheritors of that promise are those who have remained faithful to Allah, that is, the Muslims, including the Jews who have become Muslims, and not those whom he has accursed, that is, the Jews who remain Jews. The Quran puts forth a clear, consistent image of the Jews. They are scheming, treacherous liars, and the most dangerous enemies of the Muslims. Regardless of the actions of Jewish individuals today, and regardless of what policies the State of Israel follows, the Quran justifies an unrelenting form of anti-Semitism that will be extremely difficult to root out from the Islamic world. An Egyptian Imam, Muhammad Hussein Yaqub, summed up the theological argument for Islamic anti-Semitism in a January 2009 televised sermon in which he says this, If the Jews left Palestine to us, would we start loving them? Of course not. We will never love them. Absolutely not. The Jews are infidels, not because I say so, and not because they are killing Muslims, but because Allah said, The Jews say that Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say Christ is the son of Allah. 
That's Quran chapter 9, verse 30. These are the words from their mouths. They imitate the sayings of the disbelievers before. May Allah curse them how deluded they are. That's all chapter 9, verse 30. It is Allah who said that they are infidels. And this is by no means the opinion only of an extremist fringe. The Quranic impulse toward anti-Semitism is evident in the attacks on Jews emanating from Islamic preachers and scholars worldwide. Take, for example, Jews as depicted in the Quran, which is an article that was originally posted in 2004 on the website Islam Online. The website's founders include the prominent Islamic theologian, indeed the most prominent Islamic theologian in the world, the spiritual father of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, who is hailed by, as a moderate reformist by Western Islamic apologists such as John Esposito. The article, written by Sheikh Atiya Sakhir, who is formerly of Al-Asar University, copiously cites the Quran in depicting the Jews as a gang of corrupt, deceitful cutthroats. The Jews, he says, used to fabricate things and falsely ascribe them to Allah. Supporting this, he quotes the verse condemning Jews for claiming that Allah's hand was fettered, here again, chapter 5, verse 64, and another asserting that some people of the book say, we have no duty to the Gentiles, and in doing so, speak a lie concerning Allah knowingly. He adds a third verse in which some Jews asking for money scoff that Allah, forsooth, is poor and we are rich. That's chapter 3, verse 181. The Jews, continues Atiyah Sakar, love to listen to lies. This is essentially a straight rendering of the Quran's claim that the Jews are men who will listen to any lie. That's chapter 5, verse 41. They also spread lies. There is a party of them who distort the scripture with their tongues, that you may think that what they say is from the scriptures when it is not from the scripture. And they say it is from Allah when it is not from Allah. And they speak a lie concerning Allah knowingly. That's Quran chapter 3, verse 78. They dare to distort divine revelation and Allah's sacred books. Allah says in this regard, Therefore, woe be unto those who write the scripture with their hands and then say, This is from Allah, that they may purchase a small gain therewith. Woe unto them for that their hearts have for the, what their hands have written, and woe unto them for what they earned thereby. That's two verse seven, chapter two verse seventy nine. Sakar also notes that in the Quran, Allah says the Jews have broken their covenant, and consequently Allah has cursed them and made hard their hearts. Indeed, Sakar says they never keep their promises or fulfill their words. To demonstrate this, he quotes this Quranic passage: "Is it ever so that when you make a covenant?" A party of you set it aside. The truth is, most of them believe not. The Jews also refuse to believe in the prophets Allah has sent them, even Moses, telling him, O oh Moses, we will not believe in you till we see Allah plainly. They are hypocrites who grow arrogant before the messengers of Allah, refusing to believe in some and killing others. They're so arrogant and haughty that they claimed to be the sons of Allah and his beloved ones, a fault that they share with the Christians. The Quran says in chapter 5, verse 18, the Jews and Christians say, we are sons of Allah and his loved ones. All this represents the damage that Jews do to their own souls, says Sakr, but the Quran itself doesn't end there. The Jews also wish evil for people and try to mislead them. This is clear, says Sakr, in the verse that reads, many of the people of the scripture long to make you disbelievers after your belief though envy their own, uh, on their own account, through envy on their own account, after the truth has become manifest to them. They feel pain to see others in happiness and are gleeful when others are afflicted with calamity, as is demonstrated, according to Sakr, by this verse of the Quran, if a lucky chance befall you, it is evil unto them, and if disaster strike you, they rejoice thereat. That's chapter 3, verse 120. The Quran, Sakr points out, accuses them of taking usury when they were forbidden it, and of their devouring people's wealth by false pretenses. Even worse, it is easy for them to slay people and kill innocents, for nothing in the world is dearer to their hearts than shedding blood and murdering human beings. Coming from a supporter of jihad terror, that sounds to me just a bit like projection. Sakr grounds this on the Quran's assertion that the Jews slew their prophets wrongfully, an assertion that we have seen the Quran does not back up in any way. We'll be back with more on the Jews in the Quran 
after these messages. This here again is the ABN Jihad Watch program. I'm Robert Spencer. Welcome back to ABN's Jihad Watch show. I am Robert Spencer, and we are discussing Jews in the Quran, specifically at the moment, an article from Islam Online, the website that was established by the, no, the notorious and renowned Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi, an article entitled Jews as Depicted in the Quran by Atiyah Sakr. Uh, Sakr says, as we have been discussing, that the Jews are characterized by cowardice. To this, the Quran refers, he says, when saying, you are more awful as a fear in their bosoms than Allah. That is because they are a folk who understand not. They will not fight against you in a body, save in a fortified village or from behind walls. And so the Jews are supposed to be afraid of the Muslims and unwilling to fight them. Sakr also excoriates the Jews for their love for this worldly life, as does the Quran. And you will find them greediest of mankind for life and greedier than the idolaters. That's chapter 2, verse 96. Greedy for life. It's noteworthy that the Quran says in another place that if the Jews love Allah, let them show it by loving death. And we see many jihadis in the present day speaking about their love for death and how they will win because their enemies love life, but they love death. And it is true. As Christians and Jews also, we love life. We know that God is the creator and the author of life. We don't love death. Death is the result of sin. Death is the result of the alienation of mankind from God. So the idea that they love death or that the Jews should love death and that they are criticized in the Quran because they love life, we'll just consider the implications. Sacker concludes on an optimistic note, voicing hopes that someday, Allah will help the Muslims to mete out divine punishment to their enemies. Almighty Allah told us, he says, that he would send to them people who would pour on them rain of severe punishment that would last till the day of resurrection. All this gives us glad tidings of the coming victory of Muslims over them once Muslims stick to strong faith and belief in Allah and adopt the modern means of technology. One could consider or should consider Sakr's interpretation in light of Iran's feverish attempts to acquire a nuclear bomb alongside the repeated vows 
by Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to wipe Israel off the map. For Ahmadinejad and his ilk, eliminating the Jewish state is not just a foreign policy goal. It is a religious imperative. Oddly, Atiyah Sakar in this Islam Online article is silent about the infamous Quranic passages in which Allah transforms disobedient Jews into apes and pigs. That's found in chapter 2, verses 63 to 66, chapter 5, verses 59 and 60, and chapter 7, verse 166. Although some scholars argue, the, some Islamic scholars that is, that this curse only applied to a specific group of Jewish Sabbath breakers, the Jews of today are commonly called apes and pigs throughout much of the Muslim world. Although Saudi authorities promised after the September 11th attacks to revise textbooks that teach hatred against Jews and Christians, as late as 2006, Saudi texts still referred to Jews as apes and Christians as pigs. And in April 2008, a British employment tribunal awarded 70,000 pounds, that is $115,000, to a teacher who had been fired from a Saudi-funded Islamic school for exposing that the school's textbook spoke of the repugnant characteristics of the Jews and asserted, those whom God has cursed and with whom he is angry, he has turned into monkeys and pigs. They worship Satan. There is an endless parade of similar examples. In March 2004, Sheikh Ibrahim Muderis, speaking on official Palestinian Authority television, railed against the Jews today, taking revenge for their grandfathers and ancestors the sons of apes and pigs. And during the swine flu scare of May 2009, Sheikh Ahmed Ali Uthman, the superintendent of Dawah, that is Islamic proselytizing, affairs at the Egyptian Ministry of Religious Endowments, declared that all pigs are descended from the Jews whom Allah transformed into apes, swine and worshippers of Satan, and must therefore be slaughtered. Uthman based his argument on chapter 5, verse 60 of the Quran, one of its notorious apes and pigs passages. In his televised sermon denouncing the Jews regardless of their actions in Israel or elsewhere, Muhammad Hussein Yaqub also invoked this theme. As for you Jews, he says, the curse of Allah upon you, the curse of Allah upon you, whose ancestors were apes and pigs. Allah, we pray that you transform them again and make the Muslims rejoice again in seeing them as apes and pigs. You pigs of the earth, you pigs of the earth, you kill the Muslims with that cold pig blood of yours. Jews as apes and pigs is in the Quran, the holy book of the religion of peace. It's also a venerable idea in Islam. As a matter of fact, in 1853, when Admiral Sir Richard Burton, the famous British explorer, not Elizabeth Taylor's husband, but a notable figure in uh, British colonial history in the 19th century, when he posed as a Muslim and took a trip to Mecca, took the pilgrimage to Mecca, he was in Arabia, and he spied a, uh, an, a species of Arabian monkey that had uh, hitherto been unknown to him. And he was told by the local people there, oh, those are the Jews, the Jews whom Allah transformed into apes. Yet the Jews need not suffer their fate passively, for the Quran offers them a way out. Its second chapter contains an extended meditation on all that Allah has done for the Jews, and the ingratitude with which they repaid him. Allah warns them not to part with my revelations for a trifling price, which Islamic commentators generally interpret as an exhortation to put the service of Allah before the concerns of this world. Maududi, the Pakistani Muslim theorist, politician, and commentator on the Quran, says that this verse refers to the worldly benefits for the sake of which the Jews were rejecting God's directives. Many have speculated, however, that this verse amounts to Muhammad's rebuke of those who sold him material that they told him was divine revelation, but was not. At any rate, the one thing that the Jews can do to get back into Allah's good graces is to convert to Islam. This might sail right by the English-speaking reader, since the translations exhort them to be steadfast in prayer and practice regular charity. That's how the uh, most common translation of the Quran in English, that of Abdullah Yusuf Ali, puts it. But in Arabic, the word used here for prayer is salat, and for charity, zakat. This is chapter 2, verse 43 of the Quran that I'm referring to, and these refer specifically to Islamic prayer and almsgiving. Non-Muslims cannot pray salat or pay zakat. 
Ibn Kathir is forthright about the need for this conversion. In his commentary on this verse, he says, Allah commands the people of the book to be with and among the Ummah of Muhammad. Likewise, the great theorist of the Muslim Brotherhood and commentator on the Quran of the 20th century, Sayyid Qutb, observes that here Allah invites the Israelites to join the Muslims in their religious practice and to abandon their prejudices and ethnocentric tendencies. The Quran goes on, says Maududi, to refer to the best known episodes of Jewish history. As these episodes were known to every Jewish child, they are narrated briefly rather than in detail. The reference is intended to remind the Jews both of the favors with which the Israelites had been endowed by God and of the misdeeds with which they had responded to these favors. The favors include the Israelites being rescued from Pharaoh and the feeding of the people with manna and quails in the wilderness, which was matched by Jewish misdeeds, such as the golden calf episode, all culminating in the avowal that the Jews were covered with humiliation and misery. They drew on themselves the wrath of Allah. This was because they went on rejecting the signs of Allah and slaying his messengers without just cause, this because they rebelled and went on transgressing. Again, that's chapter 2, verse 61. Ibn Kathir applies these words to all Jews. This ayah, he says, indicates that the children of Israel were plagued with humiliation and that this will continue, meaning that it will never cease. They will continue to suffer humiliation at the hands of all who interact with them, along with a disgrace that they feel inwardly. Thus, the Quranic view of the Jews can be summarized quite succinctly. They're doomed to disgrace unless they become Muslim. Now, when discussing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, pundits and politicians often tell us that Jerusalem is one of the holiest cities of Islam. Indeed, it's third holiest city, right after Mecca and Medina. But in reality, the Islamic claim to Jerusalem is extremely tenuous and is based only on a legendary journey of Muhammad, a journey that is at best a dream and at worst a fabrication. The Quran refers to this journey only once and obliquely. Islamic tradition fills in the details and connects Jerusalem with the words of the Quran. But the Quran itself never explicitly mentions Jerusalem even once, an exceptionally inconvenient fact for Muslims who claim that the Palestinians must have a share of Jerusalem because the city is sacred to Islam. Muhammad's famous night journey, or mirage, is the basis of the Islamic claim to Jerusalem. The Quran's sole reference to this journey appears in the first verse of chapter 17, which says that Allah took Muhammad from the sacred mosque in Mecca to the farthest, or Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, there was no mosque in Jerusalem at this time. It appears that the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount was constructed later precisely with this verse in mind. So the farthest mosque probably wasn't really the one that now bears that name in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, Islamic tradition is firm that the mosque referred to in this passage of the Quran is indeed in Jerusalem. Now, this is all the Quran says, but according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad's vision of the journey was as dramatic as anything that happened during his prophetic career. His first biographer, Ibn Ishaq, records that Muhammad described the journey as beginning, while I was lying in al-Hatim, or al-Hijr, that is, an area in Mecca opposite the Kaaba, identified by Islamic tradition as the burial place of Hagar and Ishmael. When Gabriel came and stirred me with his foot, soon after that, someone came to me and cut my body open from here to here, and he gestured from his throat downward. The one who had come to him, Muhammad continued, then took out my heart. Then a golden tray full of belief was brought to me and my heart was washed and filled with belief and then returned to its original place. At that point, Muhammad was presented with the burak, an animal he described as half mule, half donkey, with wings on its sides with which it propelled its feet. When I came up to mount him, Muhammad reported, according to Ibn Ishaq, he shied. Gabriel placed his hand on its mane and said, Are you not ashamed, a burak, to behave in this way? By God, none more honorable before God than Muhammad has ever ridden you before. The animal was so ashamed that he broke out in a sweat and stood so still that I could mount him, says Muhammad. They went to the Temple Mount, 
and from there to paradise itself. According to a hadith, Muhammad explained, I was carried on it, and Gabriel set out with me till we reached the nearest heaven. When he asked for the gate to be opened, it was asked, Who is it? Gabriel answered, Gabriel. It was asked, Who is accompanying you? Gabriel replied, Muhammad. It was asked, Has Muhammad been called? Gabriel replied in the affirmative. And then it was said, He is welcomed. What an excellent visit his is. Muhammad entered the first heaven, where he encountered Adam. Gabriel prods Muhammad, this is your father, Adam, pay him your greetings. The prophet of Islam duly greets the first man, who responds, you are welcome, O pious son and pious prophet. Gabriel then carries Muhammad to the second heaven, where the scene at the gate is reenacted. And once inside, John the Baptist and Jesus greet him. You are welcomed, O pious brother and pious prophet. In the third heaven, Joseph greets him in the same words, and Muhammad and Gabriel go on, greeted by other prophets at other levels of heaven. In the sixth heaven, there's Moses, occasioning yet another dig at the Jews. When I left him, Muhammad says, he wept. Someone asked him, what makes you weep? Moses said, I weep because after me there has been sent Muhammad as a prophet, a young man whose followers will enter paradise in greater numbers than my followers. In the seventh heaven, Muhammad meets Abraham, has further visions, and receives the command that the Muslims pray 50 times daily. But returning, Muhammad passes by Moses, who tells him to go back and argue Allah down to a more manageable number. Muhammad complies, finally agreeing with Allah on five daily prayers. Now, Muhammad's account of his journey to paradise, quite understandably, met with considerable skepticism, perhaps abetted by his wife Aisha's statement that the apostle's body remained where it was, but God removed his spirit by night. Nonetheless, that is the foundation of the Muslim claim to Jerusalem. Now the claim to Jerusalem is by no means the sole instance of Islamic appropriation of things from Jewish tradition or things that are Jewish by possession, even while casting curses on the Jewish people themselves. Muslims generally believe that the famous episode in which the patriarch Abraham almost sacrificed his beloved son, presented in Genesis as an object lesson in obedience to Allah, and a pro uh, I'm sorry, object lesson in obedience to God. Of course, the word Allah is the name that uh, the Christian speaking, Arabic speaking Christians use of God. I generally have been trying to use the word God for the God of the Bible and Allah for the God of Islam, not to deny that Arabic speaking Christians use the same word, but only just to try to minimize the confusion between the two and to make it clear when I am speaking about Judaism or Christianity and when I'm speaking about Islam. In any case, the uh, Abraham sacrifice of his beloved son presented in Genesis as an object lesson in obedience to God and a prohibition of human sacrifice featured Abraham's son Ishmael, the father of the Arabs, not Isaac, the father of the Jews. In Islamic tradition, it is Ishmael who is the sacrificial son, not Isaac. Islamic scholars argue that one sign that the Jews have corrupted their scriptures, which we have discussed in previous weeks. The idea that Abraham and Moses, and David and Solomon and the rest actually taught Islam, but that the Jews dared to tamper with the scriptures and to remove references to Muhammad and to change the Islamic message of their scriptures. This, uh, this, the, one of the evidences that the Islamic scholars bring forth for this is that the Jews claim that Isaac is the sacrificial son when clearly it is Ishmael. And so in the Quranic account, which can be found in chapter 37, verses 102 to 112, Abraham sees in a dream that he has to sacrifice his son. But similar to the biblical story, Allah stops him just before he is about to do it. It was all a test. Which son did Abraham almost sacrifice? Well, the son is not actually named in the Quranic text, but Isaac's birth follows the story of the near sacrifice, thus implying that the son almost sacrificed had to be Ishmael because Isaac wasn't even born yet. Ibn Kathir explains that, surprise the sur surprise, the Jews are the ones who got the story all wrong. According to their book, says Ibn Kathir, is Abraham commanded, Allah, I'm sorry, a Allah commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son. And in another text, it says his firstborn son. But here they falsely inserted the name of Isaac. This is not right because it goes against what their own scripture says. They inserted the name of Isaac because he is their ancestor, 
while Ishmael is the ancestor of the Arabs. They were jealous of them, so they only added the idea and changed the meaning of the phrase only son to mean the only son who is with you, because Ishmael had been taken with his mother to Mecca. But this is a case of falsification and distortion, because the words only son cannot be said except in the case of one who has no other son. Furthermore, the firstborn son has a special status that is not shared by subsequent children, so the command to sacrifice him is a more exquisite test. So once again, we see that the Quran claims, according to Islamic tradition and Islamic commentators, that the Jews are guilty of falsifying and distorting what they have received from Allah. And as the Quran says, they will pay the penalty for their disobedience, arrogance, and obstinacy, both in this world and in the next. And so we come to the notorious Hadith that is the foundation for the idea that genocide of the Jews is an Islamic religious imperative. Nothing less than that. There is a famous hadith <coughs> repeated with minor variations several times in the hadith collections of Bukhari and Muslim, which Muslims consider to be the most reliable hadith co collections. And in its, fullest, in its fullest form, it goes like this. Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, as saying, the last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims will kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree and a stone or a tree would say Muslim or the servant of Allah there is a Jew hiding behind me come and kill him except for the Garchad tree for it is the tree of the Jews now this is very clearly saying the last hour will not come. That is, the consummation of all things, the day of judgment, the end of the world, will not come until what happens? Until the Muslims fight against the Jews and the Muslims kill the Jews. And so one of the ways in which the Muslims can hasten to bring on the end times, according to Islamic eschatology, is to kill Jews. And the more Muslims kill Jews, the more likely it is that the end times will be ushered in, and the last judgment, and the consummation of all things. When, of course, according to Islamic tradition, Jesus will return. But, of course, it's not the second coming of Christ as envisioned in Christianity, but rather a very different view of Jesus, another Jesus, as Paul specifies, Jesus who is uh, not Christian son of God, not the uh, idea that the, uh, n the Christians have of the savior of the world, but a Muslim Jesus who will come back and the Hadith says that he will break the cross, kill the pigs, and abolish the jizya. Now breaking the cross obviously means that he will destroy Christianity, Christianity as it is currently constituted. Christianity being the uh, worship of Jesus who died on the cross, who is the son of God who came to save the world, and so on. The cross is abhorrent to Muslims because, as we will see when we discuss Christianity in the Quran, we will see that the Quran claims that the Jews claim that they killed Jesus, but they did not kill him or crucify him. And the cross is considered to be an insult to Allah's transcendent power because how could one of his prophets, how could he allow one of his prophets to be killed? So Jesus, when he returns in the Islamic scheme of things, will break the cross, that is, he will destroy the false religion of Christianity that is the corruption, the perversion, the hijacking of the true message of Jesus, which is delineated in the Quran. And he will kill the pig, that is, he will put an end to the Christian's disobedience to the laws of Allah as set forth in the Quran, which of course include the prohibition on eating pork. And he will abolish the jizya. The jizya is the tax specified in Quran chapter 9 verse 29 for those Jews and Christians and other people of the book who have accepted the rule of the Muslims and are submitting to the rule of the Muslims as inferiors under their authority and they will pay this tax. So by saying that Jesus when he returns will abolish the jizya means that Jesus will actually abolish the dimma, the contract of protection 
that the Christians are under. And that means there will be no more protection. So what we see in the Islamic scheme for the end of the world is that the Muslims will bring about the end times by killing Jews wholesale, such that the Jews will hide behind stones and trees, and the stones and trees will actually cry out, O oh Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. And then, during the end times, Jesus will return, and he will effectively destroy Christianity. He will then either convert the Christians to Islam or kill all the Christians who are not Muslim. And then the great consummation of all things will be dawning upon the world. So the Muslim scheme of things involves the Jews being killed to bring about the end times and the Christians being killed within the end times by Jesus himself. And so we see that anti-Semitism, that hatred and contempt for the Jews is very deeply rooted within the Quran and within Islam. And that there is also a contempt for and hatred of the Christians as well, which we will examine at a later date. But it is important to note that the, uh, the idea that Islamic anti-Semitism is some import from Christianity or from 20th century Nazism, which is a very common idea in the world today, absolutely founders upon the Quran's view of the Jews as schemers, as liars, as rebels against Allah and ultimately as those who are under a curse. The Jews uh, say Ezra is the son of Allah, says the Quran in chapter 9, verse 30. There has never been any group of Jews who have ever been found who actually claim that Ezra is the son of Allah. And the verse goes on to say, and the Christians say that the Messiah, Jesus, is the son of Allah. And then it goes on to say that Allah's curse is upon both the Jews and the Christians. For in saying these things, they imitate the unbelievers of, of, of old. Now, when one believes in the Quran, when one believes that the Quran is the eternal word of Allah, the supreme guide to one's behavior, and the Quran tells, people, tells you that the Jews hate you, the Jews are your worst enemies, as chapter 5, verse 82 has it, and that the Jews will always make war against you, and that they will always lie and deceive, then, when you go out into the world and look at the geopolitical situation and you see the state of Israel trying to negotiate peace with its neighbors, withdrawing from various parts of the area in which they inhabit, uh, trying to establish some sort of a settlement that will be acceptable to both sides, to live in peace, you can see that such efforts are always doomed to failure. And they're doomed to failure because of the anti-Semitism that is within Islam that prevents Muslims who believe in the book, who study the book, and who know what the Quran says, prevents them from ever seeing the Jews as anything but inveterate enemies to be feared, to be hated, to be distrusted, but never to be lived with as equals on an indefinite basis, to be lived with in peace, to be lived with in harmony. It is clear from anyone who reads the Quran and reads it attentively and carefully and reads the ways in which the tafsir, the, commentators on the, ta the commentaries on the Quran and how the hadiths illuminate the Quranic text, anybody who studies this material will come away with the understanding that as long as there are believers in the Quran, believers in Muhammad as a prophet of Islam, believers in Allah, the God of Islam. As long as there are people who believe in Islam in the world, there will never be peace between the Jews and the Muslims, as long as there are Muslims. Now, I'm not saying that uh, there needs to be some sort of eradication of the Muslims. Obviously, that would be morally abhorrent on many levels, and these kinds of false accusations are frequently leveled. But what I am saying is that Muslims themselves need to undertake a searching reevaluation of the, what they consider to be their sacred text and to reform it in light of manifest realities of the nature and dignity of the human person and to reject the inveterate and deeply rooted anti-Semitism that is within Islam.
This has been an in-depth study of the Jews as they are depicted in the Quran and Islam. This is ABN's Jihad Watch program. I am Robert Spencer. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll be back next week.